is Jefferson Street in Nashville, Tennessee. It sits in the most incarcerated zip code in the United States of America, zip code 37208. This is a startling statistic. A North Nashville neighborhood is said to have the highest incarceration rate in the entire country. Developing now a North Nashville community is on edge after a deadly shooting. At one point, one in every seven adults living in this zip code would be incarcerated during their 30s. But it wasn't always this way. Jefferson Street is special. It was the place to be in Nashville. It was home to world famous jazz clubs and civil rights think tanks. Folks like Jimi Hendrix and Little Richard, Diane Nash and John Lewis. Some of the biggest and most influential figures in American culture and history got their start right here. In fact, the oldest black owned bank in America is on this street. This place was booming until something horrible happened. This highway. That's Highway 40, and it was built on top of this thriving community in the 1950s and 60s. The construction of this highway completely disrupted this community. It displaced thousands of residents and it upended hundreds of businesses. This process was what was known as urban renewal, and it was very racist. 1950, Philadelphia's oldest neighborhoods were caught in a spiral of abandonment and decay. As residents flocked to the suburbs, the brick row houses and crowded marketplaces of the old city faded into the shadows of a disappearing past. But urban planners were reimagining cities, and these historic blocks would soon become laboratories for change. It was something called urban renewal, which means moving the Negroes out. Getting, it means Negro removal. That is what it means. Urban renewal happened in cities all across the country. So in this video, I want to dig into the racist patterns of urban renewal. And perhaps more importantly, I want to understand how this thing that happened way back in the past is still affecting us today. Urban renewal was created by the federal government after the Second World War because there was a broad national consensus that our cities need help. Federal money coming from Washington managed locally, it became a tool that city planners could use to recreate whole sections of the city. City streets would be the planner's canvas. The Philadelphia of the future, made possible through relocation, demolition, rehabilitation, eminent domain, and money. Development director William Rafsky made urban renewal a cornerstone of the city's political reform movement, while Edmund Bacon director of the City Planning Commission, led the charge. Philadelphia is the singular case where the city planning director became the face of the urban renewal movement. Bacon had a real gift for speaking to journalists, business people, understanding a different way to reach politicians and elected officials. He was a real salesman uh, and marketer. But Bacon's combative approach proved controversial. Ed Bacon was theoretically aware of communities, but he said, don't ask the community to generate something because they just don't know. I know what ought to be. The federal government gave cities billions of dollars to tear down buildings in blighted areas and to replace them with more up-to-date affordable housing. And instead of doing that fairly reasonable thing, it became a government-funded attack on Black and Latino communities. And it typically functioned in three phases. Displace, demolish, and replace. These three elements show up in basically every city that participated in urban renewal. But what I want to do is pull them apart and look at how each of those three elements impacted Black and Latino communities in three different cities. New York City, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Nashville, Tennessee. Let's start with New York, a great example of the first function we'll cover. Displacement. There are plenty of examples to draw from, but Lincoln Center stands out as an especially offensive example of the impacts and motivation of urban and renewals displacement problem. Around the turn of the 20th century, black residents and Caribbean immigrants started to move into a part of New York City known as San Juan Hill, which was located roughly here in Manhattan. San Juan Hill soon became a neighborhood of bustling creativity. In fact, the neighborhood was so well known that by the 1930s, Duke Ellington and his orchestra had recorded a song named after it. My point is that this wasn't some random slum, which is what makes the rest of this story so tragic. Then in some ways the first chapter in contemporary gentrification. The area becomes transformed. It becomes wider, it becomes more affluent, it becomes more middle class. There were dynamic 
communities of black people, working class white folk who were, in, in short, pushed out. In the heart of Philadelphia's historic district, the neighborhood of Society Hill had long been the working class backbone of the city's port. Named for William Penn's Free Society of Traders, it contained the city's main produce market, and it bustled with the families of African American and Irish laborers. Society Hill was a deteriorated neighborhood. Broken containers, barrels full of fish and things like that were all over the place. We had the Blue Anchor Inn, which was frequented for the most part by foreign sailors, including some ladies that uh, worked the area. This was not exactly a pretty place. Bacon's office devised a plan to transform the old neighborhood. It would have been very easy to have come in and torn it all down. What Bacon imagined, though, was a combination of the new and the old. We had a plan for Dock Street, which we had to demolish. Those buildings were too far deteriorated to build a high-rise apartment project to get the kind of density we thought we needed. Bacon selected acclaimed modern architect I.M. Pei to design the centerpiece of the renewal, Society Hill Towers, which broke ground in 1963. Mayor Richardson Dilworth built a home for his family on nearby Washington Square and Bacon designed a network of greenways, creating pedestrian pathways between streets. A boy last week, who was 16 in San Francisco, told me on television, thank God we got him to talk. Maybe somebody will start to listen. He said, I got no country, I've got no flag. Now he's only 16 years old. And I couldn't say you do. I don't have any evidence to prove that he does. They were tearing down his house, because San Francisco is engaging, as all, most northern cities now are engaged, in something called urban renewal, which means moving the Negroes out. Getting, it means Negro removal. That is what it means. And the federal government is, a, is, is, a, is an accomplice to this fact. Now, this, we're talking about human beings. There's not such a thing as a monolithic wall or you know, some abstraction called the Negro problem. These are Negro boys and girls who at 16 and 17 don't believe the country means anything that it says, don't feel they have any place here, on the basis of the performance of the entire country. But now, Jim... No, am I exaggerating? No, I certainly could not say that you're exaggerating. Philadelphia Development Corporation marketed the idea of living in a restored colonial village to families that uh, had an ancestry that dated back to the colonial period. The first couple of buyers we had were Jared Ingersoll and his wife, uh, who was a very famous Philadelphian, and Henry Watts, who was the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange. I bought a house on Third Street. People who were young, like my husband and myself, we moved in because we could do a lot of the houses ourselves, and we built those houses, we rebuilt them. It was like a Vermont village. Everybody got together, everybody knew everybody. And then, as it got more and more built up, it became more stratified. In 1949, President Harry Truman signed this Housing Act into law. It was sponsored and largely architected by this guy, Senator Robert Taft. Article 1 of this bill created the legislative groundwork for something called slum clearance, community development, and redevelopment, more commonly known as urban renewal. City planners took this bill and all of the money that came with it and went to town. In New York City, it was Robert Moses, a notoriously racist urban planner. Now, you might be wondering how how do you know he was racist? Well, he was known as the power broker, a man more influential than anyone else in New York during his prime. And he intentionally designed bridges, roadways, and underpasses to keep bus riders, usually black and Puerto Rican people, from accessing parks and other amenities around the city. Robert Moses was not a good guy. He created systems of exclusion and oppression that exist to this day. South Street and Lombard Street, when I was real little, they were black neighborhoods. By the time I got to be a teenager, there was the, the first gentrification wave was Society Hill, and the blacks who lived on Lumber Street were, were gone. Then it moved over to South Street, a kind of erasure. City policy brokers did not consult with 
the very people that were being removed from their homes, everyday people feeling like they didn't have control or say over their lives, over where they lived, where they could send their kids to school. Many are the sins of urban renewal, but Society Hill became the model all around the country for how to revive city neighborhoods, not through demolition, but through preservation. In the space of two decades, Society Hill became one of Philadelphia's wealthiest neighborhoods. At the same time, Bacon's planning office guided urban renewal efforts throughout the city, creating Penn Center, Independence Mall, and Eastwick, projects that would transform Philadelphia's identity. I'm still surprised that some people were surprised when I pointed to the fact that uh, if a highway was built for the purpose of div dividing a white and a black neighborhood, or if an underpass was constructed such that a bus carrying mostly black and Puerto Rican kids uh, to a beach uh, in New York was, was designed uh, too low for it to pass by, that that obviously reflects racism that went into those design choices. That's how the Secretary of Transportation talks about Robert Moses' work, which is why this legislation on urban renewal was particularly dangerous in his hands. He appointed himself chair of the New York City Slum Clearance Committee, saying that the committee would address, quote, blighted slums that demanded urban renewal. But that urban renewal plan displaced more than 7,000 lower class families and 800 businesses. And almost all of them were black, which means that many of these displaced black New Yorkers were forced to cram into other low income communities, cutting off their access to vital resources and ironically creating new slums in different parts of the city. An additional tragedy in this whole thing is that much of these efforts were predicated on racist tropes and narratives. This poster was plastered all over the city to galvanize public support support for this effort. Over the following decades, many of the displaced Black and Puerto Rican people found themselves falling further and further behind economically. That's step one in urban renewal, displacement. And once people are displaced, their homes, their businesses, their stories, their community is often demolished. And a ton of rich history is demolished along with it. I think the best example of this is what happened in our next city, Tulsa, Oklahoma. You've probably heard of the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. It's when an angry mob of white white people destroyed a thriving black community. This massacre became the very first time in history where bombs were dropped on American soil. I mean, these bigots went to incredible lengths to demolish this community. The truly amazing thing is that these black folks were so resilient and so wealthy that they rebuilt their entire community in a matter of years. In fact, in just a few months of the 1,256 homes that were destroyed, 764 of them were already being rebuilt. In fact, this community became known as Black Wall Street after the rebuild. And make no mistake about it, this was only made possible because the Supreme Court of Oklahoma blocked the plans of the mayor of Tulsa, Oklahoma. His plan was to seize the land, demolish any remaining buildings, and build a railroad on top of it. That's him. That's what he looks like. That's the mayor and founder of Tulsa, Oklahoma. He was also a member of the KKK. This was 1921, but just 45 years after the Tulsa race massacre, urban renewal arrives with the same plan, same outcomes, but a new method. In the 1950s, almost no one in power recognized the vitality in poor communities, a vitality that would not survive in high-rise projects. Almost no one perceived what might be lost by the eradication of whole neighborhoods. In the 1950s, among the most densely populated areas in New York City was the Bronx and Moses planned to build an expressway through the heart of it. I think when I first looked at it, I thought, how the hell are we ever going to get across here? In 1949, President Truman signed the National Housing Act, creating a federal program called Urban Renewal. This vast, unprecedented federal housing program gave cities the power of eminent domain substantial areas of the city were taken from the owner. The goal was to replace chaotic old neighborhoods with planned communities. What was once a run-down, dying section of the great city of New York has been recreated. Talk to people about urban renewal. Oh, what a great thing we're doing for the poor people. The slum means disease and crime. The new projects 
mean health and happiness. There are definitions of slums, you know, the income level of the families. But while these people were poor, that didn't mean that they had a bad life, as long as they had their neighborhood. The new housing was to be built not by the government, but by private companies handpicked by the city. For the first time in history, the city could condemn a piece of property and turn it over to a private individual. Robert Moses, who was head of New York's Slum Clearance Committee, had the power to pick and choose which companies got the condemned land. They would take over these large chunks of this incredibly valuable real estate. Imagine real estate in Manhattan. He gave it out as political favors to his allies in the Democratic Party. All of the contracts came through the political clubs. They gave them to their friends who were builders or realtors or phony corporations. In the 1950s and 60s, the city of Tulsa put together a plan to seize the land in the Greenwood District again. And this time they were successful. Under urban renewal legislation, they demolished acres of land, homes, businesses, schools. I mean, this is the Greenwood District in 1950. And here it is in 2020. This highway cuts straight through the heart of the community, making the place nearly unlivable on purpose. Which brings us to the third and final phase of urban renewal. Replacement. We don't really have to look anywhere else to tell this part of the story. In Tulsa, black neighborhoods were entirely disrupted by this highway. And more often than not, that's what happened with urban renewal. Black and Latino folks were displaced, their entire communities demolished, and then they'd be replaced by a highway. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, examples abound. But I want to go back to where we started in Nashville, the place where I live. This community in North Nashville was was devastated by the highway that cut it in half. You know, the interstate was a poison that continued to affect that community in low doses even after that initial hit. And you're seeing the residue of that today. All right, all right, all right. Let me get some black fists in the chat. If you can hear me loud, crisp and clear, and we will get this party started. Boy, oh boy, do I have an interesting presentation in store for you this evening. The algorithm pushes some interesting things my way. You know, in my spare time, I'm watching documentaries and taking deep dives into world history. So when I saw this, um, or, or rather the series of videos come across my feed, I said, you know what, this is a, a great topic of discussion to bring to the FBA family, you know, to bring to us black folks, because a lot of you guys don't know about redlining and, you know, how we were segregated through real estate, even after segregation and eminent domain and, you know, urban renewal. I mean, just a little background history on myself. Um, just turned 29 recently. Um, when I was 18, I dropped out of college and I became a realtor, got my real estate license with the state of California began selling and buying properties on behalf of clients all over the Bay Area and, and the greater Sacramento region. So because of that history I have, because of that professional history, and, and at a young age, I might add, um, just naturally, I learn about things like redlining and eminent domain and urban renewal. Because God damn it, I needed to, <laughs> to know some of these things to even pass the test. I mean, not everybody even passes the real estate exam with the state. Sometimes it takes people two times, three times. I was lucky enough to pass the first try. But, you know, I, I think to myself, damn, you know so much, Mike. And it's because of your unique history, your unique experience, your unique lineage and and I say that not to toot my own horn. I say that to say, and this goes for you guys as well, no matter what your experience is, no matter what, what professional field you've worked in, um, we don't understand how good we got it sometimes. We don't understand that what may be commonplace to you or common knowledge to you is not readily known within our community. I'm talking to people behind the scenes. I'm talking to people on on uh, panel discussions, um, right after this broadcast, I'm doing a broadcast um, on a speaking engagement an author just gave. I was present uh, yesterday, I think. Um, 
This author wrote a book called Revolutionary Blacks Discovering the Frank Brothers, Freeborn Men of Color, Soldiers of Independence. She traced her family lineage. She wrote a book about her family's lineage. And just by her doing that, it exposed so much hidden history that we were misinformed of. And and I bring that up not to, just, just to say, you know, stick around because after this stream, we're going into that one next. But you know, some of the things I learned listening to her speak about this book she wrote are things like um, Black Americans are the ones who won the Civil War. Yes, you, you guys may have known that Black folks fought in the Civil War. Some people like to say the Civil War was fought over slavery. But until I listened to her speak and, and soaked in the information, I didn't really understand it like that. Um, Black people won the Civil War. The Civil War would not have been won without foundational Black Americans. So when someone like Tariq Nasheed speaks to a tether and says, hey, yo, we built this country, and people want to talk down on us and say, what do you mean you, you built this country? How, how did you build this country? You were a slave. You were a slave. You were just a no-good slave. Well, God damn it. Um, what event of history was more instrumental in building the U.S. of A. as we know it today other than the Civil War? the civil war that would not have been won if not for our ancestors. Some of the other things I learned hearing her speak, um, and we're going to be taking a deep dive into these topics in the next broadcast right after this. Um, another thing I learned was, um, did you guys know that there were free Black folks in the United States before the Civil War? There was not only free Black folks in the United States before the Civil War, but there were free Black folks in the antebellum South while slavery was in its peak. So God damn it, they want us to believe that if you're a foundational Black American, you by default are a descendant of slaves, when in actuality, there were free Black folks here since before Columbus even landed. So the whole reason I bring up the next broadcast is to say that there were some unknown truths that I learned recently by being a part of that um, speaking engagement the author gave at the American Revolutionary Institute. So because of that, what do I do? Do I say, oh, I learned something new. Okay, that's it. That's all. No, I take the time to edit some things together and put together a thumbnail and, and produce some content to bring that information to the community, to you guys. Just like how I have a background in real estate, so some of these things about segregation, redlining, eminent domain, I know this, but it takes reflection to realize, hey, what's commonplace to me may be totally unknown within the community. And, and a lot of us are astute. Come on, a lot of us are astute. We know about Black Wall Street and redlining and segregation, but um, something that I really want us to focus on on this broadcast tonight, um, a couple things. For one... And I'm actually going to ask this question to the chat and hopefully you guys can, you know, quick, fast, in a hurry type an answer for me. So, you know, we can respond to one another and, uh, and keep the content going. But um, put a Y in the chat for yes or an N in the chat for no. Did you know that Black Wall Street became Black Wall Street after it was already demolished? Put a Y in the chat for yes, put an N in the chat for no. Help me out, guys. I, I want to feel the temperature of the room. I want to know if this was new information to you like it was to me. I didn't learn this until earlier today, a few hours ago. Did you know that Black Wall Street was an area of land that was historically Black, and it was destroyed? And then they rebuilt it quick, fast, in a hurry. And what they rebuilt became known as Black Wall Street. Wait a minute, guys. I don't really think you understand me. We all know Black Wall Street was a bustling place in Oklahoma. 
where foundational black Americans had their own industry and commerce and they were entrepreneurs and they were business owners. It was all black owned, right? God damn it. They, they talk about how our money don't circulate in the community. Well, our money circulated in the community back then because we had our own community. But check this out, guys. Um, they tell us Black Wall Street, it was successful. Then the white folks, they got jealous. They destroyed it, right? But did you guys know that it was already destroyed? They rebuilt it real fast. What they rebuilt became known as Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And then after they had rebuilt it, then the white man came and destroyed it. So it got destroyed two times, not one. I got to ask the chat. I gotta ask you, Chad. I, 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 a lot of these things I don't know, and and when I understand this this new information, it it warps my perspective on reality, because our understanding of history formulates what we view as reality. So I say, God damn it, I gotta share it with you guys. I gotta share it with. You. Hey, and some of y'all be sending me emails. Uh, my email should be in the chat. Uh, Mike at keymediapro.com. Y'all be sending me receipts. Y'all be sending me information. Uh, each one teach one, right? But let me check with the chat. Y'all saying no. Y'all had no idea. Uh, sh shout out to Charles. Charles knew. A lot of people say, nope. Jerry, <laughs> Jerry says, yeah, but I'm old, though. I feel it. I feel it. Hey, so, so, so we're going to get into it. But, um, you know, we know about redlining and segregation and stuff. But I didn't really know that fact about Black Wall Street. Um, another thing I really want us to focus on today that was new to me, new information. Um, I didn't understand previously that urban renewal and what's now modern day known as gentrification, um, I didn't know that it always from the jump was predatory practices to stifle our community's growth. I didn't know that. I mean, we know years later, okay, it was bad. It had some racist undertones, but I didn't know that it was originally adopted in the first place. I didn't know that it was originally put, set forth in the first place to literally destroy our businesses and our families. I mean, we got tethers and coons on the internet talking about we shouldn't get reparations because if we get reparations, then we're just going to trick off the money and we don't own any businesses and we don't know uh, we don't know any institutions. And and guys, we owned businesses, we owned institutions, we owned our own cities and neighborhoods. And the government said, hmm, I think I'd rather have a freeway there. The government said, you know what? Uh, I, I think, I think we'll put I-5 right through your little community. So we're going to get into it, guys. We're going to get into it from A to Z. Hit the like button on the way in. Hit the cash app or the PayPal if you support the mission. Each one, teach one. I hope you guys uh, send me some emails and put me up on game. But um, this is wild, y'all. This is wild. While we knew that it was a, a bit of a racist agenda, um, I don't think you guys really understand the magnitude of which it was. We all know the resolution. We all know, yeah, no, nah, that, that, that was some racist shit that white folks was putting together. But I don't think y'all know how severe it really was. I mean, some of the people putting forth this were literally previous members of the Ku Klux Klan. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. The history was gone. They got the people out, then they tore the whole thing down and built expensive housing. In the 1950s and 60s, the federal government forced 300,000 families from their homes. The human tragedy is incalculable. This is the story of the destruction and survival of one community. Philip Payton Jr. wanted to end residential segregation in New York City. Payton was the premier black realtor of the day. In 1905, he began buying and leasing buildings on West 99th and 98th Streets, two all-white blocks on Manhattan's Upper West Side. Then he rented apartments to blacks. Blacks were saying, why shouldn't they have the opportunity to rent there in this aristocratic part of the city? 
West 99th and 98th Streets between Columbus Avenue and Central Park West became home to a community of musicians and writers. Arturo Schomburg lived on 99th Street along with James Weldon Johnson and Billie Holiday. Billie Holiday came to town. Everybody was old just to see her come in, you know, with her glamorous self and if she's in show business, you know. Many families stayed on West 99th and 98th Streets for generations. My grandfather came from South Carolina to 99th Street. I was born there in 99th Street, so that's all we ever knew was 99th Street. I started thinking about 99th Street and trying to see how many people that I remembered that lived in those houses. My parents were married in 29 West 99th Street, February 5th, 1914. They were eyes watching you. You could go down the street and you could count on my Aunt Dee being in her top floor window, looking out the window. I better not do nothing. And by the time I got home, my mother knew about it because somebody had untold my mother. I really believe anybody that lived in West 99th and West 98th Street loved it. And Come on, y'all. Peep game. Uh, these were not ghettos. These were thriving Black American communities. They put interstates through our thriving communities and then resettled us into ghetto project housing experimental situations. I mean, guys, does this sound familiar? Um, I don't know about you, but I'm a black Indian. I don't know if your grandma ever told you you native or, or if any of you guys are card carrying members of a tribe like I am, but, um, Damn, ain't that the same thing they did to us Aboriginal folks? I mean, hey, we're going to take over your land because you're thriving on it, and we're upset with that, and we're going to resettle you through like a trail of tears or, you know, an Indian removal act. I mean, it's very interesting. Through the color of the law, they do these predatory things, and now we've got history repeating itself. I mean, they, they say history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. But I say, no, it, it literally repeats itself. Yes, look how distinguished we were back then. Rocking the Pecos, got the... Hey, all the sisters got natural hair. Hold on, wait a minute. Wait a minute, I don't see nothing but natural hair. Beautiful sisters, Billy Holiday, the brothers in suits. Damn. So when they try to say, FBA, you have no culture, we are the culture. We were thriving. We were successful. So the government said, let's put an interstate through your community and put you over here in a housing project. And then that government pumped in some drugs and lax uh, social services. You know, crack pandemic here. Put some, immig put some immig immigrants in our communities. Um, does that sound familiar? We don't talk about it. It's a, a historical historical action of our government time and time again to displace us, remove us, rehome us, and then fill our neighborhoods with immigrants, with foreigners. 1914. They were eyes watching you. You could go down the street and you could count on my Aunt Dee being in her top floor window, looking out the window. I better not do nothing. And by the time I got home, my mother knew about it because somebody had untold my mother. I really believe anybody that lived in West 99th and West 98th Street loved it. And when we had to move, we were just devastated. In 1949, President Truman signed the National Housing Act, creating a federal program called Urban Renewal. This vast, unprecedented federal housing program gave cities the power of eminent domain substantial areas of the city were taken from the owner. The goal was to replace chaotic old neighborhoods with planned communities. What was once a run-down, dying section of the great city of New York has been recreated. Talk to people about urban renewal. Oh, what a great thing we're doing for the poor people. The slum means disease and crime. The new projects mean health and health. Come on, y'all. Put it in perspective, this is some sick shit. We have thriving, bustling communities. We are a success. 
So they put a freeway through it and move us to what they literally call, they literally call them projects. So they take us out of our thriving community, rehome us in projects. And what is a project? Before a project became known as a government subsidized housing development with pretty low rents, before it was known as that, what, what's the definition of the word project, folks? Uh, an individual or collaborative enterprise that is carefully planned to achieve a particular aim. Oh, yeah, I've, I've definitely been on you. I was cooking, too, y'all. I was cooking. Damn, I was cooking. <laughs> what was the last thing you even heard? <laughs> I'm glad I have the chat pulled up, y'all. I'm glad we always got the chat pulled up. I always got to stay engaged with you all. But, yeah, I was cooking. I was absolutely cooking. It was it, it was some really super hot fire, as they say. Goddamn, goddamn, goddamn. But um, give me some ones in the chat if the audio is okay now. All I was saying was that um, they moved us from our thriving communities and rehomed us in projects. And the definition of a project is an individual or collaborative enterprise that is carefully planned to achieve a particular aim. So they group together congressmen, government officials, white communities, you know. Um, they get together and they try to sell us this project. They try to sell us this notion that, hey, your community that you're absolutely happy in, this community that's thriving, um, it's really kind of slummy. It's really, you know, not as good as you could have it. So they sell us a false dream that if we relocate to this housing project, this brand spanking new development just for us, that we will have a better life. We will have a better opportunity. Damn, it's the same thing they told the natives time and time again, huh? All right. So for any of you that feel a little, let's not say insecure, but, um, you know, as someone who's never grown up in the projects or the ghetto and someone that doesn't really participate in, you know, the, the lower IQ behavior within our community, you know, you you kind of feel like it's a little bit of a blemish or it's a little bit of a stain. You know, we, we kind of got to hold the L for the the ghetto. And what goes on in the ghetto and the degeneracy and the crime. But in actuality, no, we don't. We can still be a prideful people and know that those of us that succumb to the psyops, to the government programming that is educational, through media, through housing legislation, and many other fronts at the same damn time, um, it's really not their fault. We were thriving. We were oh so successful. Sisters didn't have no weaves. Niggas wasn't sagging their pants. They was wearing suits. And damn, look how things change. What, 70 years later? 80 years later? Happiness. West 99th and 98th Streets were declared a slum in 1951, and everyone living there was told they'd have to leave. They're a definition. They didn't say that it was a slum. They said it was declared a slum. Does that picture look like it's taken in a slum to you? 
I mean, a slum is what them Africans be living in over there on the continent of Africa. A slum is what them Brazilians is living in in the favelas and shit, right? Um, that doesn't look like a slum to me. I mean, I think I see a couple newspapers on the street, maybe, but um, them black folks look real good, dress real good, strong family structure. But the government says it's a slum. So now you got to go see how that works, right? ...of slums, you know, the income level of the families. But while these people were poor, that didn't mean that they had a bad life as long as they had their neighborhood. Everybody was aiming for the same thing. Everybody would finish school, get a good job, help support your parents, you know, get married, have a family. It was togetherness that I cannot explain to you any more the better than what I'm doing. At 13, I'm looking forward to all these things that my older siblings had experienced, and we had to move. There is a space in my life right now that's missing because of that move. The new housing was to be built not by the government, but by private companies handpicked by the city. For the first time in history, the city could condemn a piece of property and turn it over to a private individual. For the first time, they say, for the first time, damn, 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 damn. The city ain't never did nothing like this before. The city ain't never said, you know what? We're going to declare your neighborhood a slum and make you move into a project. Nah, they did it for the first time with us black folks. Mm -mm -mm. Robert Moses, who was head of New York's Slum Clearance Committee, had the power to pick and choose which companies got the condemned land. They would take over these large chunks of its incredibly valuable real estate. Imagine real estate in Manhattan. He gave it out as political favors to his allies in the Democratic Party. All of the Oh, it was who? The Democrats? The ones that we're supposed to have blind allegiance to? Okay. T tell me that ain't insider trading. Tell me that ain't collusion. Tell me that ain't commingling of funds. Come on. The government's going to say, hey, black folks, you're thriving, you're successful, but we're going to label your community a slum, and we're going to let our buddies that we golf with, we're going to let our buddies that hold political office, you know, this is some buddies that, that go to the mansion parties and do the freaky ditty-like things and the, and the things on the Epstein Islands with us, yeah, we're going to go and we're going to give them your property. And they can build brand new white communities. Not only that, but we're going to give them the contracts to build your new communities that we call projects. And come on, y'all. Uh, a private corporation ain't held to the same standards as a, a political office is. Not at all. We see time and time again, modern day, where there'll be a new development. And the community will get on the books. Okay, new developer, you can build this, but you have to make, let's say, 10% of the units, um, you know, accessible to low income or or 20% of the, the properties have to be below rate market rents, right? Um, and they say, okay, we'll do it. And then by the time it's actually complete, oh, nah, they, they didn't do it after all. So come on, y'all, peep game. Contracts came through the political clubs. They gave them to their friends who were builders or realtors or phony corporations. West 99th and 98th streets and four surrounding blocks were sold for a token sum to a group of local Democratic Party apparatchiks. Five years later, the original buildings were only partially torn down. There might have been a couple of houses. And good point, sister, good point. They don't do that to the trailer parks. The trailer parks, damn, them are some slums. Them trailer parks, oh, we we know some predominantly white communities that are some slums, right? But they don't do it to the trailer parks. Why? Because the trailer parks ain't worth nothing. Our land was worth something. Them folks were taking part in uh, white flight, as they called it. They were leaving the inner city. They were going to suburbs. They left the inner city to its own devices. We have thriving communities with it. Then all of a sudden they say, nah, we'll build a freeway because we'd rather put up some shopping malls. And, you know, some uh, some new houses around it. And you, we're going to run this freeway through it. But all the other lots and parcels, you know, around the freeways and stuff, we, we aren't going to let you resettle over there. We're going to make those shopping districts and malls. And God damn it, our, our land was worth something. Our communities were built upon something historically that is sought after. So they did some greasy shit like they always do.
People were still living in. There were some diehards, they wouldn't move. We had no heat, no hot water. We still stayed until it became an emergency and they had to get us out of there. Why did you keep staying? That was our home. I couldn't. They cut off the lights on him. They cut off the water. Imagine living in your house, you ain't got no electricity, no water, and they still stayed. Our folks still would not leave. They had to come drag them out of their homes. They had to drag them out of their houses. Look at them folks distinguished. Got the hats on and the shirts and the ties and the pocket square. Sisters on fleek. Oh, damn. And they'd rather live with no electricity and no running water than to leave their community. I understand why they wanted to tear my home down. It was not a slum. I tell people I never left the old neighborhood. That is my village. That's my village. When I was young, it was painful. My man. Okay. And I got past that, and I think most of us did, by remembering what was good. And the older I get, the stronger that feeling gets. I feel pretty sad when I go by now. So many memories. Oh and they said it would last. last. That's right. We laugh about it, but yet it's a sad feeling. I feel that something was just taken away from us. Damn, look how they do us time and time again. And modern day, we've got Enemies foreign and domestic claiming we're degenerates with no culture. Meanwhile, they haven't achieved a percentile of what we've accomplished. Is Jefferson Street in Nashville, Tennessee. It sits in the most incarcerated zip code in the United States of America. Zip code 37208. This is a startling statistic. A North Nashville neighborhood is said to have the highest incarceration rate in the entire country. Developing now a North Nashville community is this is the result, y'all. We going from New York to Nashville, Tennessee. This is the result. Urban renewals happened all across the nation. And this is a perfect before and after. Thriving community, albeit we're now in Tennessee, but, but look at the result. The result is in New York as well. The boroughs, uh, the project areas became slums. Come on, y'all. Thriving communities, they turn the lights off, they turn the water, they put us somewhere else. They put crack and drugs and lax resources, uh, excuse me, not lax, uh, lax social services and a total lack of resources. And guess what? Some of us are participating in some violence. On edge after a deadly shooting. At one point, one in every seven adults living in this zip code would be incarcerated during their 30s. But it wasn't always this way. Jefferson Street is special. It was the place to be in Nashville. It was home to world famous jazz clubs and civil rights think tanks. Folks like Jimi Hendrix and Little Richard, Diane Nash and John Lewis. Some of the biggest and most influential figures in American culture and history got their start right here. In fact, the oldest black owned bank in america is on this street this place was booming did you hear that this place in tennessee that is now crime ridden had the largest black bank most successful largest black bank one cent savings bank was located on fourth avenue national motherfucker we had our own banks what are you talking about miss me with that we ain't got no culture we degenerates what puerto rican bank have y'all heard of in america oh what jamaican bank what african bank what Haitian bank? All right. All right. What what Mexican bank? I mean, none, huh? Okay. Is on this street. This place was booming until something horrible happened. This highway. That's Highway 40, and it was built on top of this thriving community in the 1950s and 60s. The construction of this highway completely disrupted this community. It displaced thousands of residents, and it upended hundreds of businesses. This process was what was known as urban renewal, and it was very racist. It was something called urban renewal, which means moving the Negroes out. Getting, it means Negro removal. That is what it means. 
Urban renewal happened in cities all across the country. So in this video, I want to dig into the racist patterns of urban renewal. And perhaps more importantly, I want to understand how this thing that happened way back in the past is still affecting us today. And if you stick around at the end, I'll show you some of the work that people are doing to remedy or fix those lasting. Hey, and real quick, shout out to the chat. Um, you guys could be watching celebrity gossip right now. <laughs> Hey, uh, y'all can be watching a movie, you can be on Hulu, y'all can be anywhere in the world right now, but you're here with me, and you learning and standing on lineage, so I thank you for it. Hit the like button on the way in, hit the cash app or the PayPal if you support the mission. If I was talking about fresh and fit and, and the Asian tranny daisy and stuff, Lord, we'd have 400 people watching right now, but I'd rather be discussing this. You feel me? Facts. I'm Garrison, and this is Subtext. Okay, so back in the early 1950s, the federal government gave cities billions of dollars to tear down buildings in blighted areas and to replace them with more up-to-date affordable housing. And instead of doing that fairly reasonable thing, it became a government-funded attack on Black and Latino communities. And it typically functioned in three phases. Displace, demolish, and replace. These three elements show up in basically every city that participated in urban renewal. Hold on. I think we should run that back. I think we should run that back and leave it on the screen for a moment. Step one, displace. Move us somewhere else. Step two, demolish. Destroy everything you we built. And step three, replace. Now it's a strip mall. Now it's a shopping center. Now it's an I-5 corridor. Now it's a new white community. All right. All right. Hey, I got to do a whole separate stream about... Um, I've learned there's so many FBA foundational black American and black indigenous aboriginal communities that these motherfuckers built uh, dams and they flooded them. They got them underwater all across the nation, underwater, maybe near a dam or a large lake near you. There is most likely a black town that they said, hmm, let's just go ahead and flood it. These three elements show up in basically every city that participated in urban renewal. But what I want to do is pull them apart and look at how each of those three elements impacted Black and Latino communities in three different cities. New York City, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Nashville, Tennessee. Let's start with New York, a great example of the first function we'll cover. Displacement. There are plenty of examples to draw from, but Lincoln Center stands out as an especially offensive example of the impacts and motivation of urban renewal's displacement process. Problem. Around the turn of the 20th century, black residents and Caribbean immigrants started to move into a part of New York City known as San Juan Hill, which was located roughly here in Manhattan. San Juan Hill soon became a neighborhood of bustling creativity. In fact, the neighborhood was so well known that by the 1930s... And don't get it twisted that creativity ain't come from you Caribbeans. That creativity, <laughs> that creativity came from us. <laughs> don't get it twisted when they rehomed us and put us in neighboring communities with you immigrants with you foreigners and now those communities decades later are known for their thriving culture that's our culture they speak of you feel me <laughs> Duke Ellington and his orchestra had recorded a song named after it. My point is that this wasn't some random slum, which is what makes the rest of this story so tragic. In 1949, President Harry Truman signed this Housing Act into law. It what did he just say? These weren't slums. These were thriving communities us black folks were in. They were so thriving, motherfuckers is, is writing records and making songs about us and shit, right? And they go and do a housing act of 1949. And yes, guys, I thank you for putting me up on game. Everybody post in the chat um, the names of any lakes you know where there are foundational Black American cities or towns beneath them. They created dams and man-made lakes to flood our communities. Desmond says Lake Michigan is the biggest one. Mo74 says Lake Lanier. Yeah, go ahead and put in the chat if y'all know of any lakes. Sergeant King says Elaine, Arkansas. I don't know if that's a lake or if that's a person, but yeah was sponsored and largely architected by this guy, Senator Robert Taft. Article one of this bill created the legislative groundwork for something called slum clearance, community development and redevelopment, more commonly known as urban renewal. Oh boy. Let me go ahead and drop a bomb. Um, Jared, thank you for the contribution, brother. 
Thank you for hitting the cash app, helping me keep the lights on. Um, Aya Hira, I'm just going to call you Aaliyah. I probably butchered that. I'm sorry. Thank you for the contribution. Oh, Lord, hold up. I think I know which one you is in the chat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I got your, uh, got your photo on your cash app. Yep. Looking like a copper color Indian. Look at you. <laughs> Thank you for the contributions, you guys. Appreciate the support. City planners took this bill and all of the money that came with it and went to town. In New York City, it was Robert Moses, a notoriously racist urban planner. Now, you might be wondering, how do you know he was racist? Well, he was known as the power broker, a man more influential than anyone else in New York during his prime. And he intentionally designed bridges, roadways, and underpasses to keep bus riders, usually black and Puerto Rican people, from accessing parts. So again, guys, in the beginning of the stream, I said when we have information that's pertinent to our community, especially historical facts. We can't keep them to ourselves because what may be common knowledge to us is not common knowledge to some. Everybody modern day knows about Tulsa, Oklahoma, but talk about this 10 years ago and people are like, Tulsa, what? Huh? Black Wall Street, who? Right? So at the beginning of the stream, when I was like, hey, like we knew that these were kind of racist legislations, but I didn't really realize. Um, you know, how nefarious it was from its inception. This is part of the shit that I'm talking about right here. Did y'all know that even before they did the urban renewal, they did some weird stuff where, like he just said, um, they would build an overpass. And if the overpass was by a black community, they would make the overpass a certain height so that our, our buses could not pass them. They were literally <laughs> segregating us to make sure we couldn't go into certain communities and go to certain parts of town by lowering the bridges to a certain degree. I mean, this is nuts. I didn't know it was that overt. I didn't know it was that. I d Damn, that's crazy parks and other amenities around the city. Robert Moses was not a good guy. He created systems of exclusion and oppression that exist to this day. I'm still surprised that some people were surprised when I pointed to the fact that uh, if a highway was built for the purpose of di dividing a white and a black neighborhood, or if an underpass was constructed such that a bus carrying mostly black and Puerto Rican kids uh, to a beach uh, in New York was, was designed uh, too low for it to pass by, but that obviously reflects racism that went into those design choices. That's how the Secretary of Transportation talks about Robert Moses' work, which is why this legislation on urban renewal was particularly dangerous in his hands. He appointed himself chair of the New York City Slum Clearance Committee, saying that the committee would address, quote, blighted slums that demanded urban renewal. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. Look at how they rape and pillage and rob us and make that shit sound sweet, don't it? Come on. Hey, guys, Um, we want to get these Negroes, these black Indian folks. Yeah, I mean, we've been trying to kill them and get rid of them for hundreds of years now, but but we just can't. Um, How do we at least get them out of these areas? Um, That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start a, um, a slum clearance. Uh, no, I'm... I'm going to start a, a committee on slum clearance, and then I'm going to say that I'm the commissioner, and I'm going to say that we're, you know, really trying to, like, demolish their communities and move them to better communities, and that's going to help everybody, right? And I'm going to give you, Bob, and I'm going to give you, Greg, I'm going to give you some contracts. I'm going to let you build the projects that they're going to. I'm going to let you redevelop the land that we're taking from them. And <laughs> look, at the, look at how they sell us a dream and make that shit sound sweet. And even still, our ancestors, our forefathers said no. So what did they do? They shut off the lights, no electricity. They turn off the running water. And even still, we said, hell no, we won't go. And the folks that were doing that, once again, the, the folks that were living in those areas, not surviving, but thriving, those folks, well, let me see if I can get a, a photo of them folks. Uh, what did they look like again? What did they look like? Mm. Oh, you know what? I'm on the wrong video. Here it is. Here it, here it go. Look at this. Damn. Damn, look at them sisters right there. Damn. I don't see no wigs. I see pearl necklaces. God damn it, I don't even see no cleavage. Okay. Okay. Pearl earrings. Nice hats. 
they was dressing in their Sunday's best Monday through Sunday. Okay. Let's see if we can find a photo of the brothers, though. Let, let me see the brothers. Oh, damn. Them was the brothers right there. Okay. All of them suit and tied up. All of them suit and tied up. Okay. And I think I see some young pups. Hold up. I, I, I think I, oh, look at the young men. Even the young men, I mean, they aren't in ties, but they got suits and collared shirts on. Every single one of them. Every single one. And they turned off the lights, stopped the running water on them folks, and they still said, nah, this our home. We gonna stay. Mm -mm -mm. But that urban renewal plan displaced more than 7,000 lower class families and 800 businesses. And almost all of them were black, which means that many of these displaced black New Yorkers were forced to cram into other low income communities, cutting off their access to vital resources and ironically creating new slums in different parts of the city. An additional tragedy in this whole thing is that much of these efforts were predicated on racist tropes and narratives. This poster was plastered all over the city to galvanize public support for this effort. Over the following decades, many of the displaced Black and Puerto Rican people found themselves falling further and further behind economically. That's And we focus on the Black folks, not just because that's our own, but because this is our land to begin with. You Puerto Ricans fled your ancestral homeland to come over here. Stop complaining. But for us, our communities were thriving. You immigrants had slum communities you lived in, and they moved us over here in your slums. Step one in urban renewal, displacement. And once people are displaced, their homes, their businesses, their stories, their community is often demolished. And a ton of rich history is demolished along with it. I think the best example of this is what happened in our next city, Tulsa, Oklahoma. You've probably heard of the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. It's when an angry mob of white people destroyed a thriving black community. This massacre became the very first time in history. Peep game, y'all. Modern day, we all know about Tulsa. But I didn't know about this. I didn't know about this, what he's about to say. I didn't know about it until I watched his video. And because of this and other unknown truths, I'm here taking the time out to present this information to you. I bet y'all didn't know this about Tulsa. Peep game. History where bombs were dropped on American soil. I mean, these bigots went. Oh, oh. And also, he's already dropping gems right there. I didn't realize that when they dropped those bombs, that was the first time in American history bombs were dropped on American soil. Damn. The first time in history, the, the government enacts eminent domain to take people's property is to subjugate us. The first time bombs are dropped on American soil is to subjugate us. Okay. Massacre became the very first time in history where bombs were dropped on American soil. I mean, these bigots went to incredible lengths to demolish this community. The truly amazing thing is that these black folks were so resilient and so wealthy that they rebuilt their entire community in a matter of years. In fact, in just a few months of the 1,256 homes that were destroyed, 764 of them were already being rebuilt. Keep game, y'all. They rebuilt ASAP, immediately. They had money, they had wealth. They said, we gonna rebuild, and they did just that. Matter of years. In fact, in just a few months of the 1,256 homes that were destroyed, 764 of them were already being rebuilt. Did you hear that, y'all? Did you hear that? Correct me if I'm wrong. He said that 700 or so out of the 1,200 homes destroyed were already rebuilt after four months. You telling me 58% of the property that was destroyed was rebuilt within four months? I bet y'all didn't know that fun fact. I bet y'all didn't know that. And here comes the real mic drop. Watch, peep game, the, the real mic drop is coming up here real soon. Stay tuned. In fact, this community became known as Black Wall Street after the rebuild. Oh, shit. Did y'all know that Black Wall Street became Black Wall Street after the rebuild? I thought it was Black Wall Street, and then they bombed it and tore it down, and then no more Black Wall Street. No. They destroyed the community. We rebuilt in record time, four months. We already got 58% of the structures rebuilt, and then... We're thriving so much, they then start to call it Black Wall Street. Wow.
wow, I didn't know that that's the order of events. I didn't know that. Put a Y in the chat for yes and an N in the chat for no. Did you know it became Black Wall Street after they rebuilt it? years. In fact, in just a few months, you probably heard of the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. It's when an angry mob of white people destroyed a thriving black community. This massacre became the very first time in history where bombs were dropped on American soil. I mean, these bigots went to incredible lengths to demolish this community. The truly amazing thing is that these black folks were so resilient and so wealthy that they rebuilt their entire community in a matter of years. In fact, in just a few months, of the 1,256 homes that were destroyed, 764 of them were already being rebuilt. In fact, this community became known as Black Wall Street after the rebuild. And make no mistake about it, this was only made possible because the Supreme Court of Oklahoma blocked the plans of the mayor of Tulsa, Oklahoma. His plan was to seize the land, demolish any remaining buildings, and build a railroad on top of it. That's him. Peep game, y'all, peep game. And and I kind of misspoke at the beginning of the stream. You know, I'm I'm human after all. This is live content. It's not that Black Wall Street was destroyed twice and rebuilt twice. What it is, is it was a thriving Black community. They're jealous. They bomb it. They rebuild it fast within a few months. And then they thrive so much, it then becomes known as Black Wall Street. Whereas I was under the, the notion that it was Black Wall Street, and they're jealous that it's Black Wall Street, so they bombed Black Wall Street. No, it became Black Wall Street after. So this part of the video I haven't even seen yet, so we're going to learn for the first time together how Black Wall Street ends. I'm sure it has something to do with urban renewal. God damn it, I'm going to be upset. I'm going to throw something. I'm going to break something. If you tell me that our community got bombed, we rebuild it in record time, then we thrive so much they call it Black Wall Street, and then they build a freeway through it. Oh, no, that better not be the story. That better, oh, Lord, that be, do I have a joint number? I, I got a joint number. I, I need a namaste because I'm telling you, I'm going to get real mad if that's the story, y'all. That better not be the story. That's what he looks like. That's the mayor and history where bombs were dropped on American soil. I mean, these bigots went to incredible lengths to demolish this community. The truly amazing thing is that these black folks were so resilient and so wealthy that they rebuilt their entire community in a matter of years. In fact, in just a few months of the 1,256 homes that were destroyed, 764 of them were already being rebuilt. In fact, this community became known as Black Wall Street after after the rebuild. After the rebuild, y'all. It wasn't Black Wall Street until after the rebuild. It was already popping. They was already rich. That's how they were able to rebuild most of it in only four months. But after the rebuild, it became Black Wall Street because they really flexing. We flexing. Y'all destroy it. We build it back even better and stay flexing. Oh, yeah. Now it's Black Wall Street. So I don't think it's that it got destroyed twice. Maybe it does because at the end of the day, the conclusion of Black Wall Street is going to be either it got destroyed or they did some shit and built some uh, a freeway through it through eminent domain and urban renewal or something. So either it did get destroyed for a second time or they used some legislation to get those black folks up out of there. But let's see. And make no mistake about it, this was only made possible because the Supreme Court of Oklahoma blocked the plans of the mayor of Tulsa, Oklahoma. His plan was to seize the land, demolish any remaining buildings, and build a railroad on top of it. That's him. That's what he looks like. That's the mayor and founder of Tulsa, Oklahoma. He was also a member of the KKK. This was 1921, but just for- Yes. Yes. We're building Black Wall Street <laughs> in a state that's ran by the Ku Klux Klan. Let me run that back. Let me run that back. The area is ran, literally ran by the Klan, and, and we still thriving, and we still surviving. They rebuilt their entire community in a matter of years. In fact, in just a few months of the 1,256 homes that were destroyed, 764 of them were already being rebuilt. In fact, this community became known as Black Wall Street after the rebuild. And make no mistake about it, this was only made possible because the Supreme Court of Oklahoma blocked the plans of the mayor of Tulsa, Oklahoma. His plan- Oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't on a macro level. He wasn't running the state. He was literally running the city. Tulsa, Oklahoma, the mayor was a Klan member. The city, Tulsa, is ran by a Klan member, and we still thriving.
They bomb our shit. We rebuild. It's known as Black Wall Street. The Klan, KKK mem, uh, fucking mayor, wants to destroy it. We got to go through Congress to make sure he don't get to do that. But what happens to it? What happens? And shout out to Bridget. I got to drop a bomb for Bridget. I'm eating some of them Thin Mitts right now. Our girl Bridget sent your boy some boxes of Thin Mitts. I'm in heaven. Shout out to all the Girl Scout troops. Represent was to seize the land, demolish any remaining buildings, and build a railroad on top of it. That's him. That's what he looks like. That's the mayor and founder of Tulsa, Oklahoma. He was also a member of the KKK. This was 1921, but just 45 years after the Tulsa race massacre, urban renewal arrives with the same plan, same outcomes, but a new method. In the 1950s and 60s, the city of Tulsa put together a plan to seize the land in the Greenwood district again, and this time they were successful. Under urban renewal legislation, they demolished acres of land, homes, businesses, schools. I mean, this is the damn y'all. Damn, 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 damn. Hold on, I'm gonna take a sip of water. I'm, I'm just gonna try to refrain from bugging out right now. Hold up. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, I gotta spark up. I gotta, I gotta light an incense. I wish I had some sage on deck. Hey, you know, as black folks be rocking with that sage, right? But they say we crazy if we say we engine. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Check it out, y'all. We got a thriving community in the Greenwood District. The Klan commits domestic terrorism and drops bombs on us. First time bombs are ever dropped on American soil. Within four months, we rebuild most of the town. It's thriving so much, it's known as, as Black Wall Street. The mayor, who's a KKK leader, tries to get the land, demolish it, eminent domain. We go through Congress. We prevail. So decades later, through urban renewal, they destroy Black Wall Street. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why I do why I do. This is why I do what I do, how I do it, y'all. I, I did say I just, um, I just sparked a joint, so excuse the slight slip of the tongue. I'd say it still produced pretty good live content, even while inebriated, if I do say so myself. But peep game, y'all. Peep game. They want us to believe, or at least the official narrative is, Black Wall Street ended due to some racist folks bombing it. Yes or no? Put a Y in the chat for yes. Put an N in the chat for no. Isn't the official narrative that they want us to believe that, like, you know, Tulsa had Black Wall Street? And it was thriving, and then it got bombed, and then no more Black Wall Street, right? I mean, that's at least how I was taught it. I was taught Black Wall Street, Black Wall Street destroyed, no more Black Wall Street. But apparently, that's that's not the case. Apparently, it was already a thriving Black town. They bomb it, then they rebuild it in record time. It becomes Black Wall Street, and then decades later, through urban renewal, the government demolishes it. Damn, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Lord, oh, Lord, I had no idea. Guys, it wasn't the Klan that destroyed Black Wall Street. We beat the Klan. It was the government. Oh, Lord, it was the government. It was the gubbity gubbity gubby government. It's the government. It's the gubbity 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 government. The government. It's the government. It's the gubbity 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 government. It's the government. It's the government. It's the gubbity 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 government. The government. It's the government. It's the gubbity 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 government. So spread the word, spread the word, spread the word, spread the word. Tell your neighbor, look to thy neighbor and make sure they go tell 10 black folks sometime over the next week. Each one, teach one. Look at thy neighbor and say, over the next seven days, it's your job to make sure 10 black folks who did not have the information are now armed with the information that Black Wall Street was not destroyed by the Klan. We rebuilt it in record time after that, and then it became Black Wall Street. Black Wall Street was destroyed by urban renewal. Look to thy neighbor. Hold them accountable. If each one of us teaches 10 black folks this little piece of information, God damn it, we, we got to control the narrative. It's also crucial. It's also crucial. Damn, I'm learning right along with y'all. This is crazy. This is crazy. Let's go ahead and keep on with the content. Clan can't get us. 
They shut off the lights, electricity. We still don't want to move. They got to come through and create some new words. Uh, urban renewal, they say. And now they can make you go away. Wood District in 19 of Oklahoma blocked the plans of the mayor of Tulsa, Oklahoma. His plan was to seize the land, demolish any remaining buildings, and build a railroad on top of it. That's him. That's what he looks like. That's the mayor and founder of Tulsa, Oklahoma. He was also a member of the KKK. Yes, the, the mayor of Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Klan member, wanted to, um, after it was bombed, say, no, Blacks, y'all don't get to rebuild. Instead, let's build a railroad on top of it. And only because we went through Congress, we got that shit vetoed. Okay. This was 1921, but just 45 years after the Tulsa race massacre, urban renewal arrives with the same plan, same outcomes, but a new method. In the 1950s and 60s, the city of Tulsa put together a plan to seize the land in the Greenwood District again, and this time they were successful. Under urban renewal legislation, they demolished acres of land, homes, businesses, schools. I mean, this is the Greenwood District in 1950, and here it is in 2020. This highway cuts straight through the heart of the community hold on i gotta go back what did they do to our black wall street what did they do damn on the left was black wall street and on the right is literally a freeway good god and they just so happened to want to build it through the thriving black part yeah yeah okay and shout out to Jared. Jared at the cash up again. He said, uh, so nice. Had to tip you twice. <laughs> I appreciate it, brother. I appreciate it. Rent's coming up soon. Okay. Rent is coming up soon. Producing content is a full-time gig for me. So I thank you guys for supporting the broadcast. God damn it. They built a highway through there. As if that highway has been such a... A, a net positive to the surrounding community. I mean, the highways that were sold to us as a guise to uh, have fast travel, go 65 miles per hour, no stoplights, no traffic lights, right? Um, and modern day, I mean, they're death traps and traffic jams. So yeah, I think I would have much rather had a Black Wall Street there, if you ask me. This highway cuts straight through the heart of the community, making the place nearly unlivable on purpose. Which brings us to the third and final phase of urban renewal, replacement. We don't really have to look anywhere else to tell this part of the story. In Tulsa, black neighborhoods were entirely disrupted by this highway. And more often than not, that's what happened with urban renewal. Black and Latino folks were displaced, their entire communities demolished, and then they'd be replaced by a highway. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, examples abound. But I want to go back to where we started in Nashville, the place where I live. This community in North Nashville was devastated by the highway that cut it in half. Now, the interstate was a poison that continued to affect that community in low doses. And God damn it, y'all, we got to talk about it. Um, although segregation sounds nice, apparently, historically, if we're just looking at the data, facts over feelings, um, our community was far better off when we were segregated. Damn, y'all, damn. So just like they sold us an idea of some project, they later sell us some idea of desegregation, but don't tell us that they're going to not give us bank loans and still put us in ghettos. And uh, all right, it's interesting, y'all. Um, put that in the psyche. Public education school system wants us to believe that desegregation was the best thing to happen to black folks. Nah, we was a million times better off pre-desegregation else to tell this part of the story. In Tulsa, black neighborhoods were entirely disrupted by this highway. And more often than not, that's what happened with urban renewal. Black and Latino folks were displaced, their entire communities demolished, and then they'd be replaced. By now, before anybody accuses me of being a separatist, like uh, Umois Johnson, I mean, I've got to say, I've got to be candid. Um, just because we were better before desegregation is not a call for segregation. I think we can have our cake and eat it too, proverbially speaking. Why can't we still have our own thriving communities where we make up the majority of the populace, where our dollar is able to circulate and circulate and circulate, 
And if we have to go to the white side of town to do some business, or we just so happen to have some white friends or some, some, then, then we can still intermingle with the whites on a case by case basis as we see fit. I don't think segregation should be in legislation, should be forced. I don't think if we're in public, we should have to go to separate water fountains or separate bathrooms or ride in the back of the bus. But why can't we have our own communities, thriving communities, and not be oppressed? Because if you really think about it, it's not that Black folks were really upset about the segregation. They were upset with the oppression in public. I've got my community. You go yours. If a Black folks in a white part of town, God damn it, he must have had an invite and vice versa. But when we go in public, we should be equal. By a highway. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, examples abound. But I want to go back to where we started in Nashville, the place where I live. This community in North Nashville was devastated by the highway that cut it in half. Now, the interstate was a poison that continued to affect that community in low doses even after that initial hit. And you're seeing the residue of that today. And to be clear, this highway didn't replace a slum. It barreled through a thriving black neighborhood. It was kind of like the main artery in the heart of black Nashville. North Nashville is in the position that it's in today because of decades of harmful and frankly racist policies. And urban renewal was one of those policies. And before folks from other cities look down on Nashville, the same can be said about almost any city in America with a sizable black population. Like Atlanta, where I'm from, Boston, Buffalo, DC, Houston, Minneapolis, New York, Oakland, Philadelphia, and countless others participated in this racist initiative. Racism shaped American cities and the impacts are right in front of us. Okay, thankfully some cities are taking the necessary steps to right that wrong. The cities of San Francisco and Evanston, Illinois name urban renewal explicitly in their reparations proposals. The activists in Asheville, North Carolina see urban renewal as a central part of the case that they're making for reparations. The reality is that communities will have to address these harms in their own ways. But one thing is for certain. These wrongs must be righted. Come on, y'all. This is wild. Put a one in the chat if you learned something new today. Put a one in the chat if I taught you something new today. I know I'm learning. Let's keep on with the content. A boy last week who was 16 in San Francisco told me on television. Thank God we got him to talk. Maybe somebody will start to listen. He said, I got no country. I've got no flag. Now, he's only 16 years old. And I couldn't say you do. I don't have any evidence to prove that he does. They were tearing down his house because San Francisco is engaging, as all, most northern cities now are engaged, in something called urban renewal, which means moving the Negroes out. Getting, it means Negro removal. That is what it means. And the federal government is, a, is, is, is an accomplice to this fact. Now this. We're talking about human beings. There's not such a thing as a monolithic wall or, you know, some abstraction called the Negro problem. These are Negro boys and girls who at 16 and 17 don't believe the country means anything that it says, don't feel they have any place here on the basis of the performance of the entire country. But now, Jim... No, am I exaggerating? No, I certainly could not say that you're exaggerating. Now we're going to get over to Philly, y'all. I'm taking y'all around the nation. We started with New York. We went to Tennessee. Now we're going to Philadelphia. Born and raised on the playground is when I spend most of my days. Come on, y'all. Let's go. Let's go. In 1950, Philadelphia's oldest neighborhoods were caught in a spiral of abandonment and decay. As residents flocked to the suburbs, the brick row houses and crowded marketplaces of the old city faded into the shadows of a disappearing past. But urban planners were reimagining cities, and these historic blocks would soon become laboratories for change. Urban renewal was created by. All right, guys, peep game. I want to give you this history from different perspectives. So, this video we're going to watch is like 90% from the white perspective. These people that are mostly gonna be interviewed are white folks. They're gonna talk about how they sold this idea to the white community. And then of course, at the end, we are gonna have some black folks speak, but we already saw the PSYOPs, the programming aimed at us. 
Now let's look at how they were programming their fellow white folks to get along with the get along. Because again, the only people that um, urban renewal really benefit are the politicians and the real estate developers. Yeah, of course, the white people get some new houses on a shopping center or something, but the real beneficiaries were the government and private conglomerates. The federal government after the Second World War, because there was a broad national consensus that our cities need help. Federal money coming from Washington managed locally. It became a tool that city planners could use to recreate whole sections of the city. And what you talking about am I eating? I thought I was on mute. <laughs> Y'all hear me smacking over here? Yes, I am eating. You know, life of a full-time content creator is at times challenging. I forget to eat and sleep. I'm eating a Caesar chicken wrap, grilled chicken with Parmesan cheese, lettuce, and Caesar dressing. It's quite good if you ask me. But we stand in on lineage and we getting our calorie intake in for the day, okay? Let's listen to how it was sold to them folks. City streets would be the planner's canvas. The Philadelphia of the future, made possible through relocation, demolition, rehabilitation, eminent domain, and money. Development director William Rafsky made urban renewal a cornerstone of the city's political reform movement, while Edmund Bacon, director of the City Planning Commission, led the charge. Philadelphia is the singular case where the city planning director became the face of the urban renewal movement. Bacon had a real gift for speaking to journalists, business people, understanding a different way to reach politicians and elected officials. He was a real salesman uh, and marketer. But Bacon's combative approach proved controversial. Ed Bacon was theoretically aware of communities, but he said, don't ask the community to generate something because they just don't know. I know what ought to be. Urban renewal was in some ways the first chapter in contemporary gentrification. The area becomes transformed. It becomes wider, it becomes more affluent, it becomes more middle class. There were dynamic communities of black people, working class white folk who were, in, in short, pushed out. In the heart of Philadelphia's historic district, the neighborhood of Society Hill had long been the working class backbone of the city's port. Named for William Penn's Free Society of Traders, it contained the city's main produce market, and it bustled with the families of African-American and Irish laborers. Society Hill was a deteriorated neighborhood. Come on, y'all. We had some European immigrants amongst us. We had some, um, <clears throat> some uh, white working class Americans, still European immigrants, although they've been here a little bit longer <laughs> than the ones fresh off the boat. But we even had them folks living in our communities as well. And they also got kicked out through urban renewal. So, you know, it was mostly racism. But um, above all else, it was classism. Because at the same point in time, there were other very affluent Black communities or mixed race communities that weren't necessarily impacted in the same way. So this seems to be something that's much more um, found in urban environments and wherever there's a majority population of thriving Black folks. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. I mean, if you're a member of the bourgeoisie and you're living over in Beverly Hills or something, I mean, I, I, I don't think they're doing urban renewal over there. But if you're an inner city successful Black man... All right, they come into a, a neighborhood near you. Broken containers, barrels full of fish and things like that were all over the place. We had the Blue Anchor Inn, which was frequented for the most part by foreign sailors, including some ladies that had worked the area. This was not exactly a pretty place. Bacon's office devised a plan to transform the old neighborhood would have been very easy to have come in and torn it all down. What Bacon imagined, though, was a combination of the new and the old. We had a plan for Dock Street, which we had to demolish. Those buildings were too far deteriorated to build a high-rise apartment project to get the kind of density we thought we needed. Bacon selected acclaimed modern architect I.M. Look how they sold it. Look how they sold the vision. <laughs> Look how they uh, present this to the white community. Hey, um, it's not that we're going to send them Negroes into housing project developments and pack them like like rats and cockroaches and, and pump them with drugs and guns and have them kill each other off. We're not going to do that. What we're going to do 
is we're going to put them in these high rises, these high rises that are affordable income. And um, it's it's not that we're going to cram them up there together uh, on top of each other. It's that we're going to get the the urban density that we desire. Listen to, to the verbiage, y'all. It's not that they're going to, you know, pile us up with limited resources on top of each other. It's that they're going to uh, get, get the insert air quotes here, um, urban density. Demolished. Those buildings were too far deteriorated to build a high-rise apartment project to get the kind of density we thought we needed. Bacon selected acclaimed modern architect I.M. Pei to design the centerpiece of the renewal, Society Hill Towers, which broke ground in 1963. Mayor Richardson Dilworth built a home for his family on nearby Washington Square. Damn, the politicians, the private uh, developers, they get to get a little parcel or two for themselves, built their own private homes there. Meanwhile, they kicking us to the curb. All right. And shout out to Aaliyah. Thank you again for the contribution. I appreciate your support, darling. And let me know, um, what part of the country are you tuning in from? I've been looking at my data uh, recently in the YouTube studio, and I think it tells me that about 60% of you guys are on the West Coast and 40% are on the East Coast, but I always love learning where you guys are tuning in from. And Bacon designed a network of greenways, creating pedestrian pathways between streets. The old Philadelphia Development Corporation marketed the idea of living in a restored colonial village to families that uh, had an ancestry that dated back to the colonial period. Listen to how it was sold to the white folks. Hey, this is going to be like a colonial village and you're going to be able to like, you know, get in tune with like your ancestors who lived in the colonies, right? Listen to how they sold it. Come on out. It's a colonial. But hey, white folks, it's not that we're going to put you really close to each other to maximize profit. It's that you're going to have a colonial village, you know, to, to kind of honor your ancestors who were colonists. <laughs> Listen to this shit. His family on nearby Washington Square. And Bacon designed a network of greenways, creating pedestrian pathways between streets. The old Philadelphia Development Corporation marketed the idea of living in a restored colonial village to families that uh, had an ancestry that dated back to the colonial period. The first couple of buyers we had were Jared Ingersoll and his wife, uh, who was a very famous Philadelphian, and Henry Watts, who was the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange. I bought a house on 3rd Street. People who were young, like my husband and myself, we moved in because we could do a lot of the houses ourselves and we built those houses, we rebuilt them. It was like a Vermont village. Everybody got together, everybody knew everybody. Day. <laughs> yeah, because y'all all white folks, come on. They sold the white folks an idea of moving into a colonial village. And from their perspective, this is cool. This is retro. It's like honoring the ancestors, dude. And like, we're surrounded by all of our white bros. And like, yeah, <laughs> come on. So on the one hand, they sell it to us a certain way. They sell it to them another way. Either way, it's some bullshit. Um, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm running behind schedule. Um, as soon as this broadcast ends... Don't go anywhere. There's going to be a 10-second countdown on the screen, and it's going to redirect you into the next broadcast. On the next broadcast, we're going to be taking a deep dive into the Civil War. More specifically, I was a part of a speaking engagement put together by Shirley L. Green. Or rather, it was put together by the American Revolutionary Institute, but the speaker was author Shirley L. Green. She has a PhD um, in Ohio. Is I think Ohio. Toledo, Ohio. Um, and she wrote a book about some of her ancestors. It's called Revolutionary Blacks Discovering the Frank Brothers, Freeborn Men of Color, Soldiers of Independence. Um, this is some great information, guys. If you're able to, to stick around to the next broadcast, up, it's really, it's really going to be worth it. Um, there's a lot of myths that we dispel about the Civil War. And at the end of it, you're going to have a whole new sense of renewed pride in your culture and your ancestors, to be frank. Because, um, yeah, history says uh, we won the Civil War. History says when we say we uh, laid the foundation, I mean, what's more foundational than um, winning the Civil War on behalf of America? I mean, we literally built this country, but let's get into it. I'll see you on the next broadcast.